Greece and Italy in transition, Syria under siege, and Occupy Wall Street on its way out. All politics is global this week on A View from the Bridge. The crisis in the Eurozone and its ramifications for the world economy has dominated the headlines in the last week, with Silvio Berlusconi being forced from office in Italy and Greece installing a new interim Prime Minister, Lucas Papademos, as both countries seek to impose severe austerity packages. In the Middle East, Syria has been coming under increased pressure, even from the Arab League, for the continuing brutal crackdown on protesters by the Assad regime. And in the United States, the two key issues have been the breakup of the anti-Wall Street protest camp in New York and the growing unease with President Obama's inability to stimulate the economy and create jobs. Joining us for this episode of A View from the Bridge is Ben Richardson, who is currently the International Affairs Editor for the Cambridge Student. Zhu Gong, who is currently head of the Cambridge University Emerging Markets Society, and Professor Christopher Hill, who's currently the Sir Patrick Sheehy Professor of International Affairs in the Department of Politics and International Studies, Cambridge University. We begin our first segment with perhaps the most interesting of this week's news, Bunga Bunga and the End of Berlusconi. Joining us, I'm going to start with Professor Hill. Um, now, Berlusconi has been Premier of Italy since the early 1990s, 1994 to be exact. And he seems to have survived scandal after scandal after scandal. Could you answer just a simple question that sort of has been on the mind of many political commentators? Will Berlusconi resurrect himself, or is this indeed the end of the Berlusconi era? Berlusconi, some people think, would need a stake driven through his heart to get rid of him completely, and he's certainly not out of the political scene. Just today, he's made a statement saying that the government majority will depend on the will of his party and indeed the government of technocrats is in no position to withstand a vote of no confidence but they will Berlusconi will have to give the government some time but he's certainly uh, extremely hurt and wounded by his uh, premature removal and uh, he and his allies in the Labour Nord uh, will certainly be watching for any uh, possible failure in the government and they could bring it down at any moment. Now Premier Berlusconi said on Italian television that his resignation was an act of love uh, for the people of Italy. Uh, that being said, um, after this recent term, even if he were not to come back, what really is his legacy uh, as Premier over these past two decades? As far as the outside world is concerned, his uh, uh, legacy is one of uh, ridicule and humiliation for Italy in the eyes of the world. because. If any other um, Prime Minister had behaved in the way that Berlusconi has, both in terms of his personal morality and his playing fast and loose with the law, uh, he or she would have been out of power within about five minutes. And it's very uh, noticeable that The Economist, for example, which admittedly tends to think of itself as a kingmaker in these matters, has led on several occasions with front pages condemning Berlusconi and saying that he was not fit to rule. Um, so there is something rather unusual about Italy and about Berlusconi. Now, uh, Ben and Zhu, uh, in terms of, of his impact on Europe and on Italy, personal issues aside, because obviously his, his personal life has been almost as colorful as Bill Clinton's. Um, <laughs> what, more so. More so. But that being said, what do you think is his legacy to Italy itself in terms of political legacy? Well, to me... He's a super salesman. I mean, he's very good at do not solve problems and turn any event to his advantage, even in this economic crisis. What we see is he pretend that he has to do all he can, and he, it is not his fault. And I think that's his kind of trick when he, when he tried to pretend that he's really able to do something, but actually he 
Mm, I, I think it's legacies and overridingly negative one. Um, between 2001 and 2010, um, lots of other economies were growing really quite fast. Um, only two countries grew slower than Italy, um, Haiti and um, Zimbabwe. It's an absolutely terrible um, legacy. So even on an economic basis, I think it's just been an absolutely woeful um, communistic regime. Now, on the economic front, we also have a Eurozone crisis, and that ob obviously contributed to Berlusconi's departure. Zhu, as someone who looks at emerging markets and has looked at the Eurozone issue, is it feasible that with such disparate economies and, nat and national interests among the 17 member states of the European Union, that an agreement can really be reached to solve the root of this crisis? Well, I have to say, personally, I'm quite pessimistic on this problem. Um, the Eurozone is a kind of political innovation. It's a union of 17 separate countries that share the same currency and interest rate. It looks all fine when things go well, but when, when crisis comes, it, it's just a kind of political disabled mechanism because there's, there's ideally we hope a uh, best solution for every country can generate a best solution for the whole. But the reality is not. It's not possible to any country accept a, a result that is not best to see their benefit. But that's the reality. But we don't have a powerful um, organization to look after the benefit as a whole. So I think that's a, that's a deadlock here. It, it demands a very long and kind of complex negotiate, negotiation between the 17 countries. But I don't think people have the conf confidence and patience. Now, given that, that you have 17 different nations with different agendas and a number of structural issues and what you just said. Um, do you think that buying bonds, as, as the Chinese government is considering doing um, from the European Union, is a wise investment for developing countries, not just China, but perhaps India, perhaps emerging economies? But the problem comes to why the emerging countries like China would like to buy bonds. Consider that even the Eurozone can't, can't guarantee its existence tomorrow. Why anyone would like to buy bonds? Right. But, and please feel free to jump in. Given the fact that you have so many structural issues, European Union, financial, <coughs> political will, um, social cohesion, um, economically speaking, in the long term, do you think that this is something that um, Europe can transcend? Or do you think that we are going to see another crisis unfold, another debt, another debt issue with another European Union member state. Professor Ben? Well, the definition of a crisis, well, actually, the Chinese definition of a crisis is it's an opportunity, of course. So it's, there's certainly an opportunity here. But my definition of a crisis is that you come to a wide uh, division in the road, and you have to go right or you have to go left. You can't just continue going on in the way that you were. And I think that's the situation with the European Union at the moment. It's very interesting that some people are canvassing the idea of greater union because that is the only path forward to deal with the Eurozone, that you'll need a proper fiscal <coughs> union and an economic government. But you're not going to get that with 17, let alone 27 countries. You might get it with a, a kind of the original six of the, of the ec economic community, uh, a kind of core zone uh, around Germany, a federal system, if you like. Or the whole thing might fall apart. And that's the, the risk. There's a polarization now of the options. Um, and I suppose... China and other countries might take the long view that they don't want to see Europe descend into economic chaos and, and long-term <coughs> recession because China now has a stake in the economic well-being of Europe and of the United States because it holds uh, lots Big, of interests. Biggest export market, isn't it? Hmm? Europe's and um, China's biggest export market. So it has a vested interest in making sure that Europe's economy thrives. Um, what I'd add to that is I think that the um, ECB, um, lots of member countries need to a lot of money into the ECB and the European um, Stability Fund, and um, firewall. Uh, sorry, provide a firewall around um, big well, oil Italy. I I tend to believe that China or emerging countries would like to save the eurozone if they can, but I really doubt whether they have the ability to do that. I mean, it's, it's not. Own, yeah, no. it's not on their own. It's no, the same. it's got to be a combination of, of external investment and probably the ECB printing. Some money. Which now, Joe was now Ben. Do. Ben mentioned an interesting point um, about about the ECB. Mm -hmm. um, Angela Merkel mentioned uh, a, a 
yesterday, um, the issue of political union. Do you think that this crisis perhaps may be a tipping point for political integration of the European Union? Um, I think it will certainly mean a lot of political consolidation. I don't think it will mean complete political union um, for the reasons that um, people have already, already said. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Well, switching topics briefly and looking at Palestine's bid for UN membership, Ben, Given the events of the past few months, uh, the fall of Gaddafi, the revolution in Egypt, now with Palestine, do you see the acceptance of Palestine into UNESCO as an act of provocation or a step towards peace in the Middle East? I don't think it's a direct act of either, but I think it's probably a step towards peace. I think um, the Palestinian state is in both Israel and Palestine's interests. And I'm fairly appalled at how Israel's reacted to the bid and the US cut about 20% of UNESCO's funding and Israel's accelerated construction in the West Bank. Um, I think the key point is that with a fully functioning um, Palestinian state, um, extremism in Palestine will be dampened down and that's in Israel's interests and I think what it's doing is it's, it's the wrong path for it. Now, um, Professor Zhu and Ben, briefly, the idea of having a two-state solution, having a Palestinian state, received its first uh, substantive support actually from President George W. Bush in 2003-2004 uh, timeframe where they were looking at state building. And then obviously there was the election of Hamas in the Gaza Strip and uh, a great deal of political turmoil following that. Given the fact that Hamas as a political organization and as a terrorist organization that currently controls the Gaza Strip is committed in its charter to the destruction of the state of Israel. Do you think it is correct that UNESCO should recognize a state whose clear aim, or who's controlled by a political party whose clear aim is the destruction of the state of Israel? It's a matter of political judgment. Uh, the Palestinians who have been divided between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority but have come together for the first time recently, um, effectively, um, have got very few levers uh, to pull in the international system. Israel holds most of the levers uh, itself, and the two-state solution, although theoretically on the table, has been gradually uh, nibbled away at by uh, Israeli settlements in practice. It's a kind of state that might be attractive to the Palestinians is now no longer really available, and Israel anyway doesn't seem actually inclined to negotiate. It, it, it is the status quo power, it holds the cards, and therefore the Palestinians have had very few options. Now, you, you can put labels on, 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 on Hamas or whatever you like, and certainly they have, they have done some disreputable things, many disreputable things, but the, the fact is that uh, most of the great powers have been talking to Hamas anyway, off the record. Um, right. So there is a great disjunction between the formal discourse and what's actually going on.